and welcome uh, to our spoiler review for episode seven of Shogun here on the Outlaw Nation channel. You all have been uh, following us every week, and we're picking up more and more people every week who are discovering our reviews for Shogun, and we very much appreciate it. I am the Outlaw John Roca, joined as always by my friend in Shogun love, but also a well-versed James Clavell historian and uh, who has been an has done an incredible job over the last few weeks comparing the books, the book to the series and giving us a whole new dimension to our reviews. Ladies and gentlemen, my co-host on the Cinephiles, Steve Morris. Steve, how are you? I'm doing very well. I'm back up in the Bay Area again in beautiful yeah. Tiburon, California, looking at my mom's computer rather than mine, and I am doing really well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm excited to jump into this uh, uh, Chapter 7, Episode 7 here, Stick of Time, directed by Takeshi Fukunaga, written by Matt Lambert. And this one, Steve, is very much focused on um, on Toronaga's half-brother here, Sakai, and all that he brings uh, to this camp here right after the earthquake has happened. Toronaga has been decimated. He reaches out to his half-brother, his younger half-brother, who, um, who initially seems like he's going to be on Toronaga's side, and then pulls the old switcheroo here, and at, by the end, he's the one that is working with Ishido. He's taking he's taken uh, the region, the recently vacated region's job there on the council, and in essence, is going to betray Toronaga here. And by the end, he is the one that that says verbally that he's going to lead Toronaga back uh, to Osaka to face the council uh, by the end of the episode after the unfortunate. Oh, right. And then that night, the unfortunate passing of Toronaga's son by by just a foolish accident there, an unfortunate accident, really greases the wheels now for what we're going to get into episode eight. But what did you think overall of this episode starting out before we get into the specifics? Honestly, this for me was the weakest episode we've had so far. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. And, and again, we have to go into like, well, what are my feelings about the book? And we've drifted yeah. the farthest from the book. But I felt like also there were just some repeated beats that with, that didn't advance the story, in particular, Buntaro and Mariko and Blackthorn. Yeah. It's just like, I, I already saw this, you know, like we, we, we already had a confrontation in front of Tornaga. We already had, you know, conflicts between them. Like, and, and, and again, this is, what was for me and it's not negative this is not me i don't want this to sound like me saying i thought this was a bad episode or yeah. boring or didn't make sense it's not that it's that the great momentum that i just felt was chugging along for episodes the first four or five episodes yeah. now by this episode it's like i feel and, and partially that's what's going on in the show is that toranaga is a little feels like he's stumbling and the that some of that is we're not quite sure in which direction we're going it's hard to write dramatic things about we're not quite sure which direction we're going, but this is also where, where I think the 1982, is it 1982 uh, miniseries that yeah. focused so much on Blackthorn and on the white guy. And we didn't even have subtitles for what was going on with the Japanese people right. that they went in the other direction. It was so great for the first four episodes, all the intrigue and all the stuff was going on. And the thing that I've been saying now for the last three episodes is, John Blackthorne is a really cool character and is really brilliant. And I feel that he is just for the last three episodes been totally stagnant. Yeah. And so like, I just don't like, I, and I feel like it's really, you know, if he's not the most amazing person in the world, then Mariko's feelings about him don't make sense. And she, and it makes her less amazing. Toranaga's investment of time in him makes less sense. Yeah. Buntaro's anger at him makes less sense. And so there's just sort of, one piece they've minimized him so much that the momentum it's hurting the momentum of the show that's my feeling about it i, do, I don't disagree with you and i want to get into this one of the questions i had for us to have a deeper yeah. conversation about that for sure uh but let's let's deal with his brother first let's sure let's absolutely in, sorry in, no no uh, in specifics here uh A.J. uh Eita okuno uh plays him plays psyche uh, is here psyche rather so what an interesting introduction for this character, Steve. You know, we've seen these characters come through um, throughout these first seven episodes, first six episodes into the seventh episode. And it's always fascinating the way they get a little more time to come in and kind of own the real estate of the episode. And certainly Psyche did for a number of reasons, right? Initially, it looks like he's not going to go with Tornaga at that meeting. Then the smiles come out really easily. Then they head back to the camp. 
and there's conversations. Then we have that really critical dinner at night where he embarrasses uh, Totonaga. And by the way, Totonaga has had this flashback at the beginning of the episode with uh, fighting this warlord Mizuguchi and how he beat him at 12 years old. And the legend of him is that he cut his head off in one stroke, even at 12. We find out later it was nine strokes. So clearly Seiki has some information here, but doesn't divulge it at the dinner. But what he does divulge is something even more embarrassing was that Toronaga, when he was first sent away as a hostage for to broker some peace here, the first time he's ripped away from his mother's arms, he claims that uh, Toronaga shat his pants and rode that way for like 10 miles uh, on the horse and that he felt bad for the horse. Really embarrassing uh, Toronaga here. And then, boom, does the switch, does the turn, uh, and um, uh, and reverses course on him. And by the end, he is the one that's going to escort Toronaga out uh, and of course, as I said, involved with the death of uh, of uh, Nag Nagakado. So, your thoughts overall? You, oh no, your thoughts. Period. Oh, on his role in the show in this particular episode, and how it differs from the books. The book. So the the big thing. I this is my favorite part of the episode. Honestly, it was great, and it's very different from the book. Um, the character of his brother, whose name I think is Zataki in the books, and I I'm curious of why they changed because some of the names are definitely changed. I I have no idea why they did it, and I'm sure there's a good reason. Yeah. But he it comes off as kind of a stern, humorless asshole in the books. Oh, interesting. And so this guy was totally different and yep. way more interesting. And so the moment that, like that first moment where you see him, he's looking very stern. I'm like, here we go. And then when that big smile comes across his face, I was like, oh, we're going in a totally different direction. And we're having that dinner, tells the first story. By the way, that flashback is not in the book and nothing about Toronaga that I remember again this is like a 1200 page book so I'm not saying I remember every single word that was in it but I don't remember anything about stories about him cutting off a guy's head when he was 12 or shitting his pants right both of those were great stories I, when he told the I, I I love everything they did with those stories is because he told the story complimenting him and then he tells the story insulting him and then yeah. later on we hear with Hiromatsu that he didn't cut it off as you said it took nine tries which just in my mind I'm oh. imagining the violent, horrible torture that is going on when that's happening. I mean, that's just inconceivable, like what, what he's talking about. And then the twist, that's all way better than what's in the book. Oh. The book, he just comes in and it's just a stern asshole. And it's just like, no, I'm not making a deal with you. Here's here's the, you have to come to Yedo or you have to come to Osaka yeah. to submit yourself to the council. There's none of this sort of interplay. There's none of the manipulation with his son. There's none of the embarrassing Toronaga publicly. All that stuff is really cool. And I, and I thought they did it really well in the movie. Yeah, I thought so too. I really enjoyed him as a character coming in. As I said, I thought the actor did a great job in bringing and in, in like really establishing himself quickly in the show. And you wanted to like him because he was not yeah. like he is in the books, right? He was, it was funny. He was affable. He gave, seemed to give the prop the proper respect to Toronaga. Um, and and then the and then at the dinner, and look, we all have that friend, or or we've had that friend, or we've had that family member who feels the need to embarrass you because they might be jealous of you. Or maybe some of you listening have been the family member or friend embarrassing someone you're jealous of at a table or at a function or at a get-together because you can't deal with their success. And so it's clear here because he makes little comments about how he's been guarding. It's easy to have these points of views when you've just been guarding a waterfall or whatever he says. So clearly not being, um, not feeling like he's gotten the respect he deserves. Here's an opportunity. And really, I don't know if I can fault Seiki for taking the move here, right? It's kind of like the Godfather, right? Tessio was smarter Going with um oh god I forget the going with the other the, the other Godfather who was leading a uh, leading all of this stuff Branzini Branzini right right Branzini it makes sense for him to go that route because um it seems like a power play and he doesn't believe Michael's going to be able to do it and so that makes sense same thing here it's like it makes sense that Psyche would take this opportunity to elevate his station he even says so uh and stuff so I can't really fault him though I I am against him I can't really fault him. But he's an interesting philosophical guy, too, because the last line of the episode, when Nogakata dies on the rock, he says, what was the point of all of this? Like, what's the point of this? Do you know what I'm saying? So in a weird way, he's much more circumspect about what's happening here in this world of war and political machinations than you might initially expect as you watch the, the episode. But I like the way he weaved in and out. Uh, and I like the way that this whole thing ended. And I liked his back and forth. And even his conversations with Nakata Nomi when they're in the springs, 
He's not coming after them and killing them. He's trying to woo them to his side. So it was a fascinating and interesting character that I thought was a nice foil throughout this particular episode for Tornaga. I, I I totally agree. I think this character, the way they established this character, the way he related to all the different characters makes a lot of sense. I don't fault. I, I don't think, as we've said, there's this comparison with Game of Thrones yeah. where everybody is trying to get ahead. Everybody is manipulating. So I can't fault this guy for doing his own manipulation when we've seen yeah. everybody else. That's what Tornaga is doing. Everyone's yeah. trying to manipulate them into this position. Right. But yeah, it's, it's, it's all it, he, I think is really strong. There's another sequence with another supporting character that is really strong it's as i said that stuff is working great it's the mariko blackthorn buntaro tornaga stuff that's the stuff that felt repetitive to me well we're gonna get to that let's move over to Jin. what did you think of Jin's um growing role in the show here uh yuko miyamoto playing Jin. we see her initially you know putting that seed of doubt in omi when omi comes to the tea house and wants to speak with kiku wants to see kiku and and Jin says she can't, but then he's get all. He says she says you can sleep with anybody else, and he uh, he's like I don't want to sleep because the Americans have spoiled the barbarian has spoiled your tea. I was like it wasn't Kiku she he was thinking about. So laying a little seed of doubt here, which plays out in that dinner scene when he makes the comment to Buntaro about how dedicated Mariko is to the barbarian. But later we see Jin. Uh, we find out that she negotiated with Mariko again. So that uh, Saiki could have a whole week with Kiku at a lower rate, which pisses off Tornaga. But then he gets that she gets that stick of time with him, and she pitches the idea of essentially having, um, I don't know, like a, a proletariat class of of uh, women who work in this uh, in this uh, in this tea house district in Edo. Once he takes over Edo, and he says, "Well, I don't have a future. I don't. I'm gonna probably gonna be killed. Well, I can't make these promises." And she's the one that says, like, oh, no, no, I know you've set something up here and lays it all out. And not Toronago is so impressed that by the end, when he's making his will, um, he gives her the land. So what did you think of her role in this particular episode? Can I ask what you think first? And the reason I want to say that, I so I'll just say quickly, I really like the scene. But did you did you really like the scene? Because I know a bunch more stuff that I can oh. say. <laughs> but I want to hear, like, what was your reaction before I tell you my stuff? I loved it because we haven't had a lot of time with her. But she has made the most of the real estate she has gotten throughout the first six episodes into this one. And I thought in this seventh episode, she really got a chance finally to shine in a very well-written uh, an interesting scene between the two of them, and she outflanks him. And Toronaga yeah. is not used to being outflanked. So the fact that they both come from the same kind of beginnings, uh, and and she lays out what what she's been able to do in order to achieve the things that she's achieved, and gives respect to him for achieving the things he's achieved, considering where he came from. She knows how to think like he does. So in a way, I thought by the end of the scene, she has become an ally of Toronaga's that he might be able to use down the road. And when we see Kiku doing the choking thing with Sa Saiki and then saying there's other tools, clearly there was a setup here to kill him that didn't go all the way uh, through because I think Omi and Toronaga probably, oh, I'm sorry, Omi and Nagakato probably set that whole thing up. But she allowed it. Jin kind of might have allowed that to happen in her own uh, manipulative way. So by the end, I really enjoyed her getting more real estate this episode. So I, I'm glad to hear it. I think I said from the very moment we met her, she's one of my favorite characters. I totally love the scene. I think it's great. I love the fact that she does, as you say, have insight into Toronaga that yeah. nobody else seems to have. What I'll Here's what I'll add to it, just so you know. So the yeah. first thing is she has this whole business plan about the Willow world. And, it has, and I would say it has two parts that are interesting. One of them is that in, in the book, she goes, look, we can separate essentially prostitutes from geisha which yeah. are entertainers. And so like, there's this oh. whole industry like that she wants to create that these amazing artisans who do our beautiful musicians and performers and all these things. And that they, there can be a world where they can be doing all this stuff without necessarily having sex with people. That's part of what, and she essentially wants to create a union and an organization, oh. all of which will pay up money to Toronaga. And one of the things that's in the book is that although samurai and Lords, theoretically are not supposed to worry about money at all that would be yeah. beneath them that's what yeah. merchants do that is not classy toronaga loves money yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and understands that money is what he can't have armies or anything else without money so as soon as she's talking money with her he's like oh this person is smart i like this person yeah and the other thing which i was surprised that they didn't do is she offers him secrets 
is that part of the transaction is that she knows about, I'm not going to go into what all the secrets yeah. are, but certainly she knows about the attraction with Mariko and Blackthorn. She knows things right. about Yabushige and the night where they boiled the prisoner and him with a boy and all, you know, little things like that. Yeah. And maybe she knows some things about Toronaga's brother is another thing mm. that gets offered up in this that same scene in the book. And I was surprised okay. that they didn't do that. Um, but I think it's a I think it's a really cool scene. I mm. and I I loved it. I thought it was one, it's my favorite scene in this episode. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with you. I think it's my favorite scene as well because those well-written, intellectually um, flanking, maneuvering type scenes are really great to see as the status status levels change as the conversation goes along, uh, vacillating between the two of them uh, throughout, which I thought was really great. Well, let's get into the things that you mentioned here. Let's talk about Blackthorn and Mariko and Buntaro. Blackthorn, I agree with you, Steve. This is the first episode where I finally kind of fully came on your side of this thing. With three episodes left, Blackthorn, which had started out as such a strong character, seems to be receding in importance. At, and I don't mean that he isn't important to the overall thing that Tornag is trying to do, but I mean importance in terms of um, energy and status and presence in the show. You're absolutely right. It feels like they're undercutting Blackthorn almost too much to the point where you have to question Mariko's affection for him. Remember, uh, in this episode, Tornaga calls her out about it because Buntaro wants to cut off his head, wants permission to do it. Uh, but Tornaga says, if you cut off her, his head, you got to cut off her head. And he's not ready to do that with beads of sweat all over his head because he's in love with him. He, he threatens um, Blackthorn with the sword there. Abu Yabushige does a version of trying to train him with the samurai sword. And then by the end, Mariko wants to kill herself in or, instead of dealing with all the madness that's going on in her life. And Tornaga smacks the, sword, uh, the, the knife away and even looks up into the heavens a bit uh flustered by the whole situation so talk to me about all this and you can you give go even deeper in what you were talking about here with blackthorn mariko and buntaro well the place i would start is the great scene that we had and it seemed like a lot of the structure of the previous episode was about lady ochiba and about mariko and why she yeah. got married off which ends with her toranaga saying hey your dad this did this for a reason yeah, so right. you could fight the super the the future battle and that was like a big moment. And we haven't built on that at all. It's like we totally forgot about that. Yeah. You know, because now she's asking to die. She isn't, we, we should be taking that moment and building on it for what's going to happen next. You know what I mean? Like the, that should have changed her character. Buntaro already came to Toronaga and said, yeah, right. I don't trust Blackthorn. And Toronaga said, shut the hell up. And now he's coming yeah. to him again. Yeah. You know, like th these are just things. And the thing with the, for, first of all, again, I'll have to say, Part part of it is that at this point in this book, Blackthorn speaks much better Japanese, has a much better understanding of Japanese culture. He has been, that is all he's been doing is trying to understand this world, trying to understand the language, trying to understand the culture so that he can be a good Hatamoto. And we haven't seen that. And, right. and, and that really changes, I think, how we feel about the guy. He's also, as soon as he gets swords, he's practicing learning how to use Japanese swords. He sucks at them, but he's practicing them. And so because we don't see any of that, it doesn't really matter. And the, the scene, like Yabushige's decision to pull out a sword and quote unquote train, whatever that is, it just felt weird to me. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm not like, there are certain things that are said about, you know, that you don't draw a Japanese sword, a katana, unless you're going to, you, you know, this is a serious weapon. And I'm not saying those are all as rigidly true as we might be led to believe, but this just seemed weird and sloppy and yeah. Buntaro going like, you know, is Buntaro going to kill him or not kill him? It just, it all just didn't, it didn't ring correct for me. And then Mariko after the previous episode asking to die when she hasn't done that, like what has brought her to this place at oh. this moment when she wasn't in the place, the last episode. And then she finds out about her father and all that stuff. It just, none of that worked correctly in my mind i have to say that's a valid criticism steve as i as i watch the show because they haven't done enough to establish the emotion and the connections between blackthorn and mariko they went so far the other way that they felt like okay we'll just introduce it we'll do the we'll do the broad brush strokes we'll allow the actors to kind of add levels to these interactions and then the fans will accept it or the viewers will accept it but you do have to spend time in this storyline. And they're almost like saying, well, we don't want to spend time with a white guy too much. And the thing is, you have to because you've got to make everything else that is connected to this man work. And I think what you're pointing out is such a great and astute observation, Steve. 
How do I, why do I, I get the Buntaro thing. Men are jealous. That's an easy one. But Mariko wanting to take her own life because she cannot choose between her dedication and loyalty to Tornaga and her feelings for um, Blackthorn. We've got to see these things develop, especially when she said like an episode and a half ago, we can't talk anymore. We're only going to talk through other people's words. We can't have these connections. And of course, things change. The earthquake changes. Things change. So let's see that. Let's see their interactions. Even that moment of Blackthorn is talking to Lady Fuji and to uh, 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 Mariko there, he is pacing back and forth and talking about what he wants to do. And he wants to get into his ship and he wants to, you know, and says, Mariko, we can do this. And Fuji said, what are we going to do? And then she just walks off. So there's not this thing of like, I want to defend you. I love you. I want to protect you. You know, there's there, there are moments here that I think that they're they're fumbling that need to be established much more firmly in the relationship between Mariko and Blackthorn so that we can believe the actions they're going to take in the next three episodes, which I don't know about, by the way, because I haven't read the book, I haven't read the book and, and what have you. So I'm really curious, and I don't remember the series now, but all these years later. So I'm really curious to see what uh, what is, is going to happen with them. And the Buntaro thing, I think you're right, Steve. We've hit the beats already. It's becoming repetitive and borderline boring, to be honest, yeah. because it's a little like shit or get off the pot. Like there's, 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 it's becoming frustrating to, to uh, monitor this for sure. Well, and yeah. nothing's really, nothing's really developed with Mariko and Blackthorn. Like mm -hmm. if something new developed with Mariko and Blackthorn, that would lead Buntaro, if he observes something to go somewhere new, but yeah. they've been in sort of stasis, their, their relationship. I mean, you know, if, if we're at seven out of 10 episodes, yeah. if we're, that means that we're seven or 800 pages into the book, theoretically, but right. we're not nearly so advanced in their relationship as what has happened in the book at this point. There's much more interaction yeah. between them. That's very personal. Like, so, so, and the other thing too is Blackthorn is the same beat too. What, I, when yeah. am I getting my ship? I want my ship. I want my ship. It's like, no shit. You want your ship. Two or three times in this episode, he asks for a ship. Yeah. yeah. It's like, we get it. <laughs> uh, well, let me let me ask you about a couple other moments here that happened uh what do you think what, what do you think about yes yeah the way they handle and i don't know if it's in the book in the same way but yaboshige essentially psyche brings him yaboshige's general who went to plead with ishido uh to say i'm still on your side like you know i'm doing my thing here I, i'm with you uh and he sends back the severed head of his general so Yabushige now um, very clearly having to go with Tornaga at this point. It seems like. Um, was that the way it is in the book? And what do you think about him coming up into the springs and having the back and forth with the guys there in the springs? And, of course, you already pointed out the Blackthorn stuff, so you don't have to speak about that. But the other actions from Yabushige here and getting that head, what is is it the same as the book? What does it mean? What does it indicate? Can't remember if it's the same as okay. in the book. It might be. I feel like that general dies. I don't know that... Uh, Tornaga's brother brings him the head. I okay. don't, but I feel like something like that happens. I thought the scene in the spring was neat. I, I like because I like the actors yeah. a lot. I like as you described it perfectly of of Yabushige realizing the the problem that he's in and Tornaga's brother kind of sticking it to him. I like the scene a lot. Again, I feel I've in this how you know what this happens in a lot of shows where it's like you got a ton of heavy lifting and yeah. sort of in the middle as we're we're heading from act two into act three setting up everything for our climax there's a bit of drift and yeah. that scene was a good scene but i don't know that it advanced the story in the way that i might have wanted it to yeah yeah um all right and then let's talk about this final scene here with uh psyche and what goes on in the tea house and the the tricks that i imagine i think this is omi and nagakato planning this without Toranaga's permission maybe with Jin's permission since it's at her place or just at least Kiku's permission, if nothing else. Uh, and they attack Psyche's men there. And Nagakato essentially forces Psyche out into the water uh, and is ready to land the killing blow, slips on the rock, hits his head, bleeds out into the water. Psyche doesn't take revenge, doesn't take a, pick up the sword and cut his head or kill him, just lets him bleed out and then says this line here at the end, "What? Uh, where is the beauty in this? So... Talk to me about this as a philosophical comment from Seiki in this moment. And is the death of an Agakado in the book the same manner in which he dies here in the show? None of this is in the book as far as I remember. Whoa! None of it. Really? Um, and what? I just didn't... It's None of this made sense to me. It really didn't. Um, so, first of all, like, just the, the at the end, 
that last moment, well, we had had Nagato talking about that moment where he says, I hear that your first kill can be like better than your first woman. Right. And right. so I think, you know, it's like the progression from Toronaga at 12 years old, cut this guy's head off with one stroke to he shit his pants on the way to the, his first battle right, to right. this discussion of, you know, this is like your first woman or better than your first woman to where's the beauty in this. I think that, I think philosophically, that's a really clear, like an interesting yeah. threat. Oh, yeah. we're exploring what, you know, the difference between the romantic version of vi of war and violence and the reality of sometimes you just slip and fall and you die because you, because it's stupid, yeah. you know, you know, at, at, at a whorehouse. Like, yeah, right, um, exactly. So like, I think in that sense, this works. What doesn't work for me is first of all, Nagata, he, he already killed somebody. <laughs> he, he killed those guys with the cannon yeah, and wiped those guys out. So why is he talking about his first kill? You already had your first kill. Right. You know what that's like. That's the first thing. The second thing. And again, this, because this isn't in the book is we already had Omi talk him into killing that guy mm. earlier on. Yeah. So, so, and now we have this, the, the mama -san tells Omi, you know, drips a little poison in his ear about the anjin -san. And now, so is it that Omi, through his jealousy, is now aiming Nagakata at Toronaga's brother in the same way he aimed it at this Ishido general during the canon yeah. scene? Is it, Again, it's sort of repeating a beat, except it makes way less sense. Like, and the thing, too, is that this, you know, it's one thing to go, oh, there's a general who is Toronaga's enemy. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to kill him too. I'm going to kill my dad's brother. Yeah. You know, you know, like that just, it just seems so. And was Toronaga happy about his son without his orders getting manipulated into killing somebody? No, he yelled at him yeah. and it was terrible. And so now he's doing the same thing again. Right. It just, again, we're like repeating beats. I don't quite. And, and the thing too, is the mama son who's trying to make a deal with Toronaga to, to establish yeah. this thing, she's going to let this happen in her house. Right. Like this is ruined. This ruins her entire future. If yeah. a murder can happen in this place, that's supposed to be safe. Yeah. This, I mean, I don't know how it played for you having not read the book, but mm -hmm. for me, and a lot of this is what I know from the book, but it's like, I don't get this. Like, why did all this happen? This didn't make sense to me. I, I can't assess this fully until I see what it leads to right. in the next, next episode or two, but I enjoyed the scene and what he said there, where's the beauty in this? I think there's a commentary because yes, you're right, Steve. I think you point out so well, the episodes seem to be very clear about deconstructing myths and legends by, be, right. by opening with that flashback sequence, revisiting that flashback sequence throughout the episode, all the way to the final second to final scene when, um, Toronaga says that he is going to surrender himself. And by the way, Blackthorn calling everybody out, then storming off after he is being told not to say anything, I thought was a weird moment that everyone just seemed to be okay with. Uh, no, it's totally weird. Right? Emasculating Buntaro, emasculating everybody, Hamamoto, everybody around uh, uh, Toronaga. So it was a weird moment for him to all of a sudden stand up and do that. And I don't know if it's in the book or not, but to stand up and do that. Well, nope, okay. Not in the book. Okay. So can, just, can I say one thing about that too? Yeah. I hadn't thought about it until you just said it, but yeah. In, I think the second episode, someone stands up and insults uh, Tornaga's guest, Ishido, in a way way milder than what Blackthorn does. Yes. And that guy has to kill himself and his children. Which And and, and that gets touched upon in this episode when yeah. Nagakato brings uh, the remains of the of the of uh, Fuji's husband and son there to her. And Hamamoto even tells her, like, you know, you've got to live, not die for them, live for them. There's a difference here, and so it's an interesting. That's also an interesting moment. Yes, but later, on, but yes, the idea of him slipping and all of that. Yeah, the that to me, I think, was interesting, and I liked it. I just want to see what it leads to, because right. the Nagakato deaths got to lead to something. That's his son, and you're right. They took agency yet again. Completely stupid to start a war when your army is decimated already with by having the warlord killed at a tea house. How did you think you were going to go to war? And I loved what Toronaga said to him halfway through the episode. He says, it's always the one, the young men who've never swung the blade who are eager for battle because they've never experienced the horrors of it. And I, I thought that was a nice commentary as well, but then Toronaga does it anyway. So I, I want, I'm sorry, Nagakato does it anyway. So I'm, I'm curious to see where Toronaga is going to take this and how this is going to be framed. Cause Steve, this feels like a gift that is landing in his lap rather than a manipulation, which is what we've come to enjoy from Toronaga. So I'm going to be interested to see how they make this work in the next episode or two. 
Um, all right. Anything else we want to hit on that we didn't touch on, Steve? Any other moments that are, that uh, I didn't mention here that you want to make sure we stress before we wrap up? No, no. I think I think we covered all. I think we covered all the big stuff. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. All right. Well, there you go. That's our spoiler review here for episode seven. Uh, Stick of time. Uh, we hope you enjoyed our conversation on it. Shout out, out to the direction here. I thought Takashi Fukunaga did a wonderful job directing this particular episode. Matt Lambert, another great job writing this episode. Uh, had some really great scenes that Steve and I pointed out. The dinner scene and the scene with Jen and uh, Toronaga there when she's talking when she's talking through a stick of time to get her uh, essentially her proto um, a proto prostitute class set up there, uh, set up there in Edo. So a lot to discuss, a lot to get into. What did you all think about it? Let us know down in the comment section below. What did you think of what Steve and I had to say about all of these topics and all of these particular instances and scenes? in the show and the overall thoughts on where these storylines and characters are going let us know down in the comments section below both positive and negative we're open to it all just keep it civil hit a like on this video share it on your social media subscribe to the channel down below and hit that bell button we'd appreciate it steve another wonderful uh spoiler review thanks for taking time i know you're up upstate so i appreciate you taking the time here brother man to have this conversation please let people know where they can find you and where they can maybe listen to our podcast uh show that we have well, the podcast that you mentioned is called The Cinephiles. And then The Cinephiles, for the last eight years, we have been diving into the greatest films ever made. Everything from Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton to the Cone Brothers and Christopher Nolan. We've done Lebowski. We've done every single thing that you could think of. Star Wars, Big Trouble in Little China. And we do the deepest of deep dive breakdowns, sometimes going into one, two, three, or even four episodes to get every single bit of detail in a moment by moment breakdown of these films that's at the cinephiles you can watch it on youtube you can subscribe to it on our podcast apple podcasts on uh, spotify on stitcher you can support the show at patreon.com slash the cinephiles and i definitely think you can check it out and you can uh, follow me at sr morris on twitter and sr morris one on instagram that's right. And we've covered some samurai films. We've covered some uh, uh, timepiece films of political machination, all of that stuff over the years. We average about 150 to 200,000, 250,000 downloads a month here on the show. It's a very great show. Please take a chance on it. Uh, we've covered so many films. We're in the middle of our season or we're, we're wrapping up our season of Scorsese as we jump into The Last Temptation of Christ, episode one dropping this week. We'll probably go three episodes on that one. So uh, come and take a chance on the show and enjoy that as well if you enjoy our analysis here on these Shogun episodes. As for me, you can follow me at The Roca Says on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, The Outlaw Nation on Twitch, uh, and uh, my other podcasts that I do out there, The Geek Buddies and The Hot Mic for you all to enjoy. All right, thanks so much for joining us. Come back and join us next week for episode eight of Shogun as we do a spoiler review here on the Outlaw Nation. Peace until then. Thank you.